Despite being millions of years old, the society of the Necron race has undergone very little change over the eons, even when accounting for the species' time asleep. The dynasties of old still reign supreme, albeit with a new balance of power these days but there are groups who exist somewhat outside the typical Necron power structure. One of these groups is a series of semi-political powerhouses using their abilities alongside any overlord or pharon willing to meet their exorbitant demands, whilst the other operates independently, working for the good of the species with an authority that few dare challenge. Today, we will explore both of these factions, their roles within the ancient Necron tier society, and how they conduct themselves in this modern era. The former are known as the Cryptex, whilst the latter are the only Necrons never to sleep, the Triarch Praetorians. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. As there are two factions to be discussed today, we will take each one individually. We'll start with the Cryptex, probably the more commonly seen or at least more famous of the two. The Necrons as a species are entirely without psychers or psychic ability. They may have had potential as the Necron tier, but such information has lost to the ages, and regardless, the loss of their souls to the Catan will not have helped with matters. However, that is not to say that the Necrons are incapable of feats that would be typically associated with psychers telekinesis, elemental manipulation, teleportation, and much more. The way they do this is not through some latent psychic coding or through the use of warp-touched artifacts, but instead through raw, cold, technological genius. Enter the Cryptex, the chief scientist of the Necron race and perhaps the most numerous group outside of the dynasties themselves. I assume that the Cryptex of today were also the scientists and researchers of the Necron tier, granted as near to a perfect biotransference as possible in order to maintain their vast knowledge and to expand it for the glory of the Catan who initiated it. Mind you, the shattering and ensnaring of the Catan shards was likely only made possible thanks in no small part to the Cryptex themselves. The Silent King was smart and skilled enough to lead a species, but it takes a special kind of mind to create tesseract labyrinths and whatever else was unleashed when the Necrons turned on their masters. Whatever was done to create them, most if not all Cryptex are geniuses, with their understanding of the fundamentals of the universe perhaps second to none alive today. They are able to use their understanding and their intellect in order to harness these fundamentals and build devices that channel them, wreaking havoc on those who oppose or just inconvenience them. Some call this arcane science, as it does appear to be a form of techno-wizardry to pretty much anyone who isn't a cryptech. I have no idea how it's done, even with a scientific outlook and training, so I can definitely see why enemy troops used to psychic powers might make that sort of connection. The cryptex certainly do not divulge their secrets, as almost all of them are in some form of conflict against one another. Unlocking a new technique or creating a new device can make a cryptic exceptionally renowned, and the individuality granted by the Silent King, along with the seeming hubris of the entire species, means that they won't want another stealing their metaphorical or literal thunder. Though they are all working somewhat alone, there are, if you like, five schools of thought or specialisations within the ranks of the cryptex. These are known as conclaves, and they actually span the galaxy in terms of membership and influence rather than being immaterial categorizations. The conclaves exist entirely outside the power structure of the dynasties, with the cryptex being somewhat mercenary in nature and working for whoever conveniences them and who can meet their often exorbitant demands. Some will likely simply want the resources of a certain world for part of their experiment, whilst others may want to perform large-scale field tests on biological subjects that it would be impractical to acquire or gather alone. There can even be cases of cryptex serving or possibly being indentured to a dynasty for particularly long lengths of time, though how this can happen likely varies wildly from botched experiments causing intolerable damage or perhaps some other reason for loyalty overall else. However, for those cryptex not so indentured, the lengths that an overlord or Faerun will go to in order to secure a cryptex services are almost unlimited. They make useful advisors with less ambitions of seizing dynastic power, a similar idea to the mercenaries of a Drakari court of the Archon, 
and their abilities can be incredibly useful to the dynasty both on and off the battlefield. So what are the five conclaves and what do they actually specialize in? The first, perhaps the most identifiable, are the Plasmancers, also known as Harbingers of Destruction. These are the ones you may have encountered firing giant energy beams around to obliterate and disorient foes, for energy itself is their specialism and they can transform it in any way they see fit. Their signature weapons are the Eldritch Lances, essentially plasma beam launchers, though how they're powered and wielded is beyond me, I'm afraid. Another conclave that is relatively easy to track in the chaos of a battlefield will be the Harbingers of Transmogrification, though they don't have a catchy title like the Plasmancers. This is the conclave that eventually functions as supremely advanced alchemists, specialising in the transformation of materials from one state to another, or even creating phenomena that should not reasonably be possible within elements and compounds. Their technology is able to change the toughest of armour to naught but brittle shards, and their signature weapon, the Tremor Stave, is able to induce earthquakes and even shatter solid earth, just as examples. The next most obvious conclave is one whose abilities are easy to observe, but who themselves are rather less identifiable as the cause of said abilities. They are the Ethermancers, or the Harbingers of the Storm, and their specialism is in all things weather-based, though there is no such thing as the ether. Sorry, that's just a bit of a misnomer. They can use the air to create pressure waves, induce electrical fields to strike their foes with lightning, and even create lightning-based shields around their allies to electrocute any who approach. But I wouldn't be surprised if water manipulation and possibly atmospheric tinkering lies within their field as well. Then we have the Psychomancers, better known as Harbingers of Despair. No prizes here for guessing where their abilities are focused. These cryptics are able to use their technology directly on the minds of those who oppose them. It has limited applications against the mechanical necrons and presumably against warp entities, but on typical organics it is undoubtedly effective. Inspiring fear and madness are pretty much par for the course for a Psychomancer, but the idea of illusions or trickery is also part of their repertoire, as they are aiming to seemingly teleport their allies around the battlefield as well. And finally, there are the Chronomancers, the Harbingers of Eternity. Again, no prizes for guessing the field of expertise here, it's right there in the name. Chronomancers are concerned with the flow and manipulation of time, although time isn't really an individual concept since you have space-time, but hey, when has that ever stopped these guys? They are prized as prophets and strategists due to their perception and twisting of the future and messing with the past. That said, it is rare to find a chronomancer that is trusted by basically anyone. That selfish hubris cannot be forgotten, they usually know what's coming, and what benefits the cryptech best may not necessarily align with what benefits their employer. I've even heard of Cryptax rewinding time to change events when things don't play out quite right, just for the sake of their own reputation, even if the consequences can be huge and detrimental for their employers or many more across the galaxy. There are many famous Cryptax, probably too many to name. Illuminor Caesaras and Orican the Diviner are perhaps the best known, but there are so many more, both working overtly and in the shadows of a powerful Pharaoh. Whilst the Cryptex are the developers of the future, the ones on whom the Necrons stake any hope of biotransference or new technology, there is another group far more obsessed with the past, who uphold the values of the ancient Necron tier and enforce it on the Necrons of today. These are the only individuals within the Necron race, the Silent King perhaps exempted, who do not enter the Great Sleep following the War in Heaven and the Shattering of the Catan. They are known as the Triarch Praetorians, and in the days of the Necron tier, they served as the guardians of the Triarch, who in turn ruled over the entire species. They also served as agents in the field, which may contribute to them receiving a slightly different set of upgrades compared to the Lich Guard who protect the Overlords. The Necron version of the Praetorians are equipped with anti-grav jump packs to allow them to travel quickly and presumably relatively quietly and they will usually use them to hover over and survey the battlefield before choosing their method of engagement. This feeds into probably the most frustrating thing about the Praetorians in the eyes of Necron commanders today, 
their strict adherence to the Necron tier codes of honor and the enforcement of said codes on any Necrons they fight alongside. This means that against certain races or adversaries deemed worthy, or those that have been sometime influenced by the Necrons, they will force their allies to treat them with the same respect as was given to the Necron tier during the pre gatan civil wars. Suffice it to say that almost no one likes having to do this, since it will severely limit their options in terms of strategies or committing atrocities, but I don't think I've ever seen a situation where the Praetorians have made such a decree and been openly defied. Quite why the overlords are so compliant even today remains unknown, since the Triarch is no longer a thing and until recently everyone assumed the Silent King was gone, but I assume it has a little something to do with the weapons of the Praetorians, typically something known as a Rod of Covenant. As well as presumably being a symbol of office, at least of sorts, the Rod is able to fire an energy blast that can even kill a Necron outright. Living metal melts under it, so I can understand the wariness in defying a Praetorian squad. That said, ensuring that the Necron tier fought according to the codes was a role of the Praetorians back before things went wrong, so I suspect there could be a historical carryover somewhere in the coding of the Necrons too, and it doesn't do well to actively deny the most experienced warriors in perhaps the entire galaxy. Though they now take an active role in the Necrons' weak conquest of the galaxy, they are not Praetorian stationed with every dynasty or tomb world like some form of species-wide policing force. As I already mentioned, they were the only Necrons pretty much to not join in the 60 million year sleep commanded by the Silent King. Instead, they stayed awake, travelling around the galaxy and keeping an eye on everything. Why? Because it's their penance for the failure that they see the war in heaven as. Given their victory over the Old Ones and then the Catan, the only arguable failure of the Necrons was having enough strength left over, or not in this case, to stop the rise of the Eldari in the aftermath. But the Praetorians considered that this was enough for the entire war to have been a failure requiring their atonement. As such, they chose to forsake the Great Sleep and take up a new mission of vigilance, watching over what remained of the Necrons outside of the Tomb Worlds. The Praetorians attempted to preserve Necron culture in as many ways as they could, which is slightly odd given the Necrons went into hiding as far as possible to ensure that the Eldari didn't wipe them out, though one could argue that their goal instead was to prevent the Eldari doing exactly that to their tech and their tombs. Some Praetorians went beyond the simple reservation and instead tried to propagate the ways of the Necrons and Necron tier to other races. They would do this by installing themselves on especially primitive worlds as godlike figures, using their cultivated influence to enforce Necron culture on their new subjects. It will often be these worlds and races that the Praetorians will demand the codes of honour are used against if necessary. I doubt many Faerons have a need for organic subjects to lord it over after all, but that doesn't mean they should be mindlessly exterminated. Obviously, this is just a snapshot of what the very numerous Praetorians got up to during the Great Sleep. There's a lot of them, and it lasted for 60 million years after all. But when the Tomb Worlds began waking up in M41, the priorities for the agents of the Triarch began to shift. Rather than simply preserve the Necron fragments across the galaxy until their brethren turned up, the Praetorians would travel in small hosts to any Tomb Worlds that they have records of, or that they simply stumbled upon. Once there, a contingent of Praetorians would remain on said tomb world, making sure that those codes I keep mentioning are consistently upheld by whoever is in charge. This means that larger dynasties will have a not insignificant cohort of Praetorians knocking around, especially if they control a wide empire that didn't wake up all at once. Said dynasties obviously gain from having a really solid force of elite, fast-moving warriors in their ranks, even if their place in the command structure is a little variable, and the annoyance of the occasional code enforcement is probably just about tolerable for all but the most genocidal of overlords. However, in this most recent age of the galaxy, the Triarch Praetorians have begun to focus their work back under the banner of what remains of the Triarch they once protected. In late M41, the Silent King Cesarak made his return to the Milky Way, having encountered the Tyranids during his self-imposed exile beyond the galaxy. Having decided that the Hivemind and its minions were the greatest threat to the dominion of the Necrons, the Silent King wished to unite the race he had once ruled, 
but the chosen approach to achieve this unity was not overt action. It would invite assassinations and other dangers, and not all Necrons would willingly serve. Instead, the Silent King uses the Triarch Praetorians that remain loyal to his cause, which is probably almost all of them, as his agents and hands just as the Triarch did long ago. They awaken tomb worlds that remain in slumber, and influence Phaerons from those that have already awoken, all in the hidden name of the Silent King and his mission of Necron Unity, established by a common goal rather than command protocols. Whether they will succeed remains to be seen, but the annihilation of the Terranid Scourge would definitely be a win in my book. Well, just so long as it doesn't result in being subservient to or exterminated by soulless killbot robot overlords afterwards. And there you have it, what records we have on the Necron Cryptex and the Triarch Praetorians. Whilst one faction is diehard traditionalist and the other is an innovator and creator, both fulfil a vital role in maintaining what makes the Necrons, well, the Necrons. Aside from being the same species, the Cryptek Conclaves and the Praetorian Cohorts are almost opposites, and whether working for themselves or their race as a whole, none of them are to be taken lightly or factored out of strategic planning. For now though, we must move on. Next time, I think we'll be exploring something that defies all logic, yet has become almost a point of galactic admin due to their common appearance and the ever-present dangers from the largest of their kind. Thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.